Can I first get your name and title, please? Uh, certainly. I'm Dr. Kimberly Molina. I'm the Chief Medical Examiner for Bear County. How long have you been in this position? I took over in, that's early, 2020. 2020, okay. Yes. Always been in this field? No, actually. I started my career in medicine just in general family practice and then changed to forensic pathology after a few years. Why forensics? Um, forensics is a very challenging and interesting field um, in medicine. And it's one I think that a lot of physicians don't even consider. But it is actually kind of, you're the last physician that a patient's gonna see. Um, and it provides a lot of closure, a lot of understanding for families um, as to what happened. Uh, and you have to actually know a lot of, a lot of different types of medicine. Um, for instance, you have to know surgery, was there a surgical complication? You know, medicine, what about treatments? What about medication interactions? Disease processes? So you kind of have to know a little bit about everything so that you can pull it all together at the end to provide that closure. Let's talk about what you actually do versus what people think you do. Do you feel like there's a big difference in those two things? Uh, I feel like the way we're portrayed on television is not always accurate, yes. So, what are some of the biggest misconceptions? Uh, for a forensic pathologist, well, I think in general, I think uh, television tends to um, uh, equate forensic pathology or medical examiners with law enforcement, meaning that we investigate crimes, which is not what we do. We investigate deaths. So our role is to determine the cause and manner of death, why someone died. Now, oftentimes it is because a crime has occurred, but many times it's not. It's a natural death, and we're providing that closure for families. Um, so again, we're not part of law enforcement. We're not part of the district attorney's office. We're an independent agency whose sole mandate is to determine how and why someone died. So. A lot of people think, of course, because of TV and movies, that you are, a medical examiner does autopsies all day long. Is that accurate? Is that something that's part of your daily work life? Uh, it depends on the office of where you, of what office you are and how your, your workload is um, kind of determined or set. Um, but no, we can't do autopsies all day long because we have other work we have to do. Certainly we perform post-mortem examinations, which um, people call autopsies, but they're examining, you know, the decedents to determine how they died. Um, but as part of that, we have to review medical records. Um, also, as part of our job, we testify in court. We have to do the paperwork and, you know, prepare the reports as well. So it's actually more varied than just performing the examinations themselves. And I, let's just get right to it because I know that, you know, when we met here, there's a lot that we talked about that we cannot talk about. There's a lot that your office does, information that comes out of your investigations that cannot be shared. What's the reason for that? Well, many times, as, as we just discussed, the examinations that we're performing, the cause of death or the manner of death, is a result of criminal activity. In which case, we're one piece of that investigation. We're one piece of that law enforcement, that district attorney investigation. We are not their entire investigation. Um, so, in those cases, if law enforcement or the district attorney feels that we have information that could potentially, um, uh, uh, you know, jeopardize their investigation, then we're not at liberty to release what information we have until they've completed their investigation, they've fully adjudicated the matter, um, and allow us to release that information. And there is, whether it is a crime or not, you're dealing with a life lost. There's an element of, I would imagine, sensitivity there. Um, because that is somebody, someone. That's somebody's loved one. So uh, you talked a lot when we first met about preserving the dignity of someone. Why is that important for you and what you do? That is of utmost importance to everyone in this field. Our goal, at, we talked about at the beginning, is that we are the last physicians that anyone's going to see, and we want to make sure that the answers we provide for the family are correct 
and accurate, and we want to make sure that everyone here in our care is treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Everyone who's here is someone's father, brother, mother, child, and we absolutely understand that. When people come into our care, there's not a choice, right? The families don't actually have a choice. There's some part of the mandate, the legal mandate, that has brought them into our care. We absolutely want to make sure that families understand that we are going to treat their loved ones with dignity, with respect. We're going to get the answers that they deserve. We're going to speak for them if we need to, if something's happened to them. Um, and that is pivotal. That is the, the foundation of what we do and why we do it. How do you do that day in and day out? I mean, I don't know if that's a question that people ask you a lot, but you're dealing with death all the time. That's your job. How is that something that you're able to handle professionally? We do deal with death every day, um, which I think, as you said, is, is strange to some people. Um, and it certainly does affect you. Um, there's you know, certainly things we understand about uh, the process of after someone dies, um, you know, just the legal process, the, the logistics of it that we um, bear in mind and that affects us. For instance, I think everyone in this building probably has a will because we understand you know, what happens afterwards. Um, but on the flip side of that, I would say we actually do what we do for the living, which I think a lot of people don't understand, right? Is I'm here for those families. I'm here to, again, to provide closure to those families so that they can understand what happens to their loved one, um, so I can speak for their loved one. Um, so it's not I don't think we see the death all day, we see the living. And we see those who are left behind and how we can truly assist them in moving forward. Are there times when you're able to get the living answers, get them some piece of closure? Are there times that stick with you? I mean, certain cases that you just know you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life? Uh, I think we all have those cases that just kind of stick with us or just um, for one reason or another kind of kind of affected us um, and they're not always the cases that that everyone expects. Um, I think the cases that stick with us too are a lot of times when we can't give the families closure. Um, we are limited in what medical science can do so we can't always tell people what happened with their loved ones. We can't always answer their questions uh, and I I'm very honest with families when that occurs, and I say, you know, I, I wish that I could. I want nothing more than to provide the closure and the answers that you want. Um, and sometimes when we can't, it's just as frustrating to us as it is to the families. Nicole touched on this um, when we were talking, but a lot of times, you know, TVs and, and movies give people the impression that you do an autopsy and right away you know all the answers to all the questions that you may have but that's not usually how it happens. Uh, that is very rare that that's how that happens. Uh, I relate it to you on TV, you know, you have this machine and you put the blood in and out comes the answer of exactly who they are and, and when they died and that's not how it works. <laughs> um, we all wish it did, but it's not how it works. Um, it takes time, it takes careful investigation, um, it takes studies even after the examinations, we do, you know, additional tests and additional studies. Um, so yeah, it, it takes time for us to really do our job correctly and accurately to provide and find those answers for families. Are there times where finding a, a cause and manner of death takes a long time, takes months or longer? Oftentimes, well I shouldn't say oftentimes, but yes, that, that off, that's not uncommon that that happens where we're doing initial testing or we need further information. Um, sometimes we, you know, we, we can't even start investigating the death until we know who they are. So, you know, if we have a case, for instance, where they're unidentified and we've done our exam, but we're kind of at a standstill until we can get that identification made. And then once we can, then we can start further investigating. So yeah, unfortunately it does happen where cases take, you know, weeks, months, even years for us to really figure out what happened. And that's such a huge question, I imagine, because you may have been able to answer those things about how someone died and things that you can physically see, but you don't know their name. Correct. 
So how do you go about, if you don't have any indication when someone comes into your care, how do you go about answering that question? Well, part of our legal mandate is actually to identify unidentified um, persons. So even if we know exactly, like you said, how and why they died, if we don't know who they are, that falls to us to, to figure that out. We have a great deal of tools in our toolbox to, to try to figure that out, a um, great deal of kind of different um, methodologies we can use. And it just depends on each case as to which methodologies we can use for that case. So we don't necessarily do everything for everyone because we can't. We do everything we can in that particular case until we get an identification. So, for example, one of the first things we do is visual, right? So when maybe the, bot, the um, decedent's still at the scene, anybody know this person, right? And that's, that's the most common way that we identify people here that I think people don't, don't understand is just someone they knew saw them. And we can say, okay, we know who it is. Um, moving from there, we have all sorts of other ways. We can try fingerprints. We can try um, dental if we think we know who they are. We can take x-rays and see if they have sort of any implanted hardware, for instance, a pacemaker, or maybe they've had a hip replacement, and, and try to track people down that way. So there's all sorts of different tools we can use, um, and we can actually use those tools. Even, even the same method has different tools. For instance, fingerprints, right? There's no national fingerprint database registry where we can just find you know, someone and, and identify them. So, but we can use all sorts of different databases. We can try local, we can try national, we can try international. So there's all sorts of different tools and which ones we try just depends on the case at hand. You mentioned at, you looking at something like whether someone has a medical device. If you found somebody has a hip replacement, for example, how then would, what would be the next step there? Okay, we know this about them. How would you use something like that to try to identify somebody? Well, it depends on the circumstances. So if we're assuming that this is a completely unidentified person, meaning we have absolutely no idea who they are, many times we think we know who they are and we just have to prove it's who they are, right? And those cases are easier because then we know um, who the dentist might be. We know who the doctor might be, right? And we can start kind of heading down that route. But when we have absolutely no idea, we can actually contact the manufacturer of these devices and ask them to assist us as to what hospital did you send this to? What date was it manufactured? What date was it implanted? Now the manufacturers don't usually know who has it, but they might be able to say, oh, we sent that device to this hospital on this date and we can backtrack with that hospital and say, okay, you know, who, who did you implant pacemakers in, in during this month, you know, and um, try to kind of backtrack into who it might be. And that's something that you've done before, your office has done before? Yes, we have. Wow. What about the, the people where you really have, you have no clue? I mean, that has to be a challenge. It has to be frustrating. And to know that, you know, you have this person here, but you don't know where they need to go next or where they should go next, who may be looking for them. So just for you, I mean, personally, what kind of challenge is that? Those, and those are cases, we talked about the cases that stick with you. Oftentimes, those are the cases that, that really do because you, even if you have the cause and manner of death, even if you could provide closure to family, you don't even have the family to provide the closure to. Um, so in those cases, we oftentimes, or kind of the last effort for us would be, we go back to that visual identification, and we have sketches made, and we reach out to media, and we ask media to assist us, and we say, hey, we have this sketch, we don't know who they are. Is there any way we can disseminate this out, you know, to the public and say, does anybody know this person? And try to get the public involved um, in identifications. Um, and, and, you know, we also have developed, we've taken those sketches now, and we've developed a new page on our website where we're posting these uh, sketches as well as some, you know, brief demographic information so the public can take a look. And even if you didn't realize that, you know, maybe you haven't heard from your friend Joe in several years, um, you take a look and you say, hey, I, I think that might be Joe. 
Um, they call us, the families let us know. Now we, it doesn't give us a positive identification from those sketches, but it gives us an idea of who it might be. So now our toolbox can be opened up a little bit more and we can use some of our other tools to try to figure out, is it really Joe? Uh, and try to figure that out, again, to provide that closure. How key is it for you to hear from someone who believes that is the person they know, that's their loved one? That is absolutely pivotal. Because if we don't have that phone call telling us, hey, we think this is Joe Smith, then we're still at, I don't know who any, right? Um, but if we say, yeah, we think it's Joe Smith, great. Now we can start, does Joe Smith have a doctor? Does Joe Smith have a dentist? Does he have family? Can we, you know, we can actually honestly restart our investigation from that point now that we at least have a name. It gives you someone to ask the questions you already have to actually ask of somebody else. Correct. Okay. So starting this effort to put this information online, um, how was that decision made? I mean, why is that a step that your office decided was, was a good one to take? Well, our office, of course, is very passionate about what we do, and we are very passionate about um, all of our cases here, but we want to make sure, again, our goal is to provide that closure, that dignity and respect to the decedents that we have and the closure for their families. Um, and so, and part of that dignity and respect is giving these individuals their names, right? Speaking for them, finding their name, finding their family. Uh, and we're very passionate about that. Uh, and we work very hard and we don't, we don't actually close our cases. We continue to follow up on our unidentified cases uh, as often as we can. Are there any new leads? Are there any new technologies, right? DNA, right? Is there anything else that we can do to try to get these individuals um, identified? And with that, we found, you know, the internet's a powerful tool. <laughs> Everybody's on the internet now. Um, and so we said, hey, this is another tool in our toolbox that we didn't have 20 years ago, right? 10 years ago. Now we have it, let's use it. Let's, again, we are constantly trying everything that we can to identify these decedents. And if it, if it helps identify one decedent, we've won. It's worth all of the effort to put it out there. And you've had unidentified cases for so long that in sometimes new technology has come around that you didn't have when you first were made aware of this person and now it's a new tool that wasn't there 10 years ago. Would that be accurate? Correct. So how long can it take to identify someone? Unfortunately, it can take a long time. Um, we run through all of our tools initially, right? Um, and then from there, we, you know, it just depends on what we can do. And it depends, unfortunately, on the condition of the remains, right? So, for instance, I think we're all familiar with skeletal cases. Skeletal cases can be very difficult because we, half of our toolbox is now gone, right? We don't have the visual, we don't have the fingerprints. Um, so that's where the sketches come in. We can get sketches made of what we think they might look like, um, which is helpful. But, you know, it can take years for us to get someone identified, which is why we don't give up. We keep trying. And a lot of times those sketches, like you just said, there, there may not be a visual to recreate. I mean, they're being recreated with just what you all have. Correct. The sketches are made from the material that we have, which is not always... The sketches are kind of the best we can do with the available technology, but these are not always necessarily accurate representations of, of what people look like because we, we don't know. So what happens to a person's remains if they are unidentified and that question lingers for months, for years? Where do they go? Well, luckily Bear County does have a program where they will bury remains for, um, for families who are either unable to bury their loved one themselves or where we just don't have the families. Um, and so Bear County does handle that final disposition uh, and the remains are buried very respectfully and dignified and we know where they are, which means we can, uh, if we get them identified, tell the families, yes, they were buried and this is where they are. Um, and the families can, can then go and, and visit the gravesite if they want to or can even, you know, have them moved somewhere else should they desire. Um, but we are at least Bear County is providing that final resting place 
uh, for these decedents while we're still working on them, finding who they are. What's it mean to you to be able to tell a family who might have been searching for a long time for this person that you know where they are and you know what happened to them? Uh, you know, it depends. I mean, sometimes you, you would think that that's, it's greatly satisfactory, which, which you know, it's, it's wonderful to give that closure to the families, and oftentimes the families are very appreciative. Um, on the flip side of that, sometimes we're like, you know, we're sorry it took so long. But we did the best we could, and there was a reason. We never stopped, right? And the families seem to understand that, you know, that, that these are often long, drawn-out processes. But, you know, the family's been looking, and we've been trying to find. Sometimes it just takes a while um, for us to meet. Is it a bigger hurdle when people that you're trying to identify are not from here? They're not local? Absolutely. That is, that's, you know, again, if we put the sketches out on local media, and they're not, they're, they have no local ties, it's difficult to find. Um, it, it can also be difficult, too, if, if um, you know, not only if they're maybe not from here or they're traveling through. Um, Right, so it just becomes, someone needs to be looking for them in the same area where they're missing. Um, it's also difficult if no one's looking for them. That's, that's difficult as well. And it sounds like your office has a relationship even with international resources to try to identify people who, like you said, may have been passing through or are not even from this country. Correct. I mean, I think everybody's aware that, that Texas is, we have all sorts of people who pass through this area, um, a lot from kind of Central and South America. So we work with a lot of the consulates um, around to assist us in uh, not only in the identifications, but a lot of times we might be able to identify someone, but we can't reach their families to notify them because they're in a different country. And so we reach out to the consulates for help to help with those notifications as well. Would you recommend to somebody if they're looking for someone, I mean, is it something where you can just call up the Emmy's office and, and ask if they have your loved one? You certainly can. I wouldn't necessarily know if I would recommend that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you're looking for someone, we usually recommend that you, you know, go to your police department and, and file a missing persons report. Um, one of the first places we go when we have someone who's not identified is we go to the police and say, do you have a missing persons report that meets our, our criteria? Um, and so if you file the missing persons report, that is a very quick way for us to, to make that connection almost immediately. Um, if you don't file that report, it's much more difficult because, um, you know, if a family calls us today and says, hey, do you have my loved one? And we say no. Um, we don't have any way of, of tracking back to that. So if we get your loved one tomorrow, there's no way of tracking back to the phone mm. call that was made the day before, and I you really see. don't want to call us every day. Right. So it's much better to file that police report, the missing persons report, with your local police agency. Okay. A lot of these cases of someone unidentified, you know, it's a person who was found by themselves at a, a specific time, right? But you handle cases where you've got a lot of different people who have died all at once, mass casualty events. How does that impact your office? How does it change what you do, or does it? Well, I guess in general it doesn't, right? If, if we look at the overall scope, we still have to determine how and why someone died. We still have to identify them. So, I mean, it's the same mandate. It's the same task. It's just done on a much larger scale. Um, so it doesn't really affect um, the work. Honestly, it doesn't affect how we do the work. We do quality work for everyone. We approach every case, you know, kind of the same way, regardless of, of um, you know, how many, right? We, we're going to do a, a good job for everyone who comes through here. Um, we just kind of have to ratchet up a little bit. Right, um, and by that I mean maybe we work longer hours. Uh, maybe we have more doctors working. Maybe we bring in doctors from other areas, to, from other forensic pathologists, but from other offices to assist us. Um, but again, it's the same job. We just have um, more of it to do. And you said that you have been part of the response, the aftermath for five different mass casualty events since you've been in this position? Not since I've been in this position. Ah. I've, been, I've been with this office almost 20 years. 
Um, and in my tenure here, we've had five mass casualty events that, that we've handled. Um, I think first I should probably define mass casualty because mass casualty is different to us or actually mass fatality events are different to us than what other people might think of. A mass fatality event to us is something that basically is defined as more than our normal workload so that we have to alter the way we handle things. So um, for instance, there was a bus crash, bus crash many years ago. You may remember a church bus crash out in, out in Uvalde of all places. Um, and that was a mass, ca mass fatality event for us. Um, because again, we had to change our normal workflow in order to handle those cases. Is there anything that being involved in those incidents, is there something that you've learned over the years that every time you do have a mass fatality event, you take with you to, to the next time it happens? Um, again, with these events, we the work itself doesn't change, right? So again, we we handle all of the cases with the same dignity, the same respect, the same um, quality in which we handle all of our cases. That, that doesn't change. I think what changes for us in the learning process is the logistics, if that makes sense. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna process all of this? And again, preserve the dignity, the respect, the quality of our work. Um, what do we need to do to support this office when that's going on? I know a lot of people think about, um, you know, that that the, you know, that we're doing the exams, that that you know the decedents come here from these events, but I think not as many people think about well, what's going on with the personnel inside that office, right? And how are the personnel handling it? And I think that's what we learned is how to support the the office staff because while we want the dignity and respect for these decedents, while we want the quality for these decedents. We also need to make sure that we maintain the mental health, the well-being of the personnel who are here handling those cases. Has that been challenging? It has been challenging. I think uh, in the last two years it's been particularly challenging. You mentioned the mass fatality events, but also COVID. Uh, I think you know COVID increased our workload here. It took a toll on, um, again, increasing the workload, but also just a toll on the staff. Um, quite honestly, we saw COVID cases, COVID deaths coming through every day. That, that takes a mental toll as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a challenging two and a half years here. And you came in to this position in 2020. In the middle of the epidemic, of the in pandemic, In the yes. middle of the pandemic. Yes. Wow. New job, new pandemic. <laughs> it's, it's been a challenging couple of years. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, is there anything that you wish people knew about a medical examiner's office, about your position, um, that they don't? Uh, I think a lot of times that people don't really understand what we do until they have to interact with our office. Um, we, prior to the pandemic, tried to do a great deal of outreach with hospice, hospices, hospitals, um, you know, community groups, just so people could understand what it is that we do, what our mandate is. Um, I think that, you know, the most um, common preconception that people have is that if someone comes to our office, if the death falls under our jurisdiction, they think immediately, oh, they think someone killed them, that it's a homicide, that, that all we do here are homicides. And we do do homicides here, that is our jurisdiction. But our jurisdiction is actually any unnatural death. So car accidents, um, people who fall down and maybe hit their heads, uh, or cases where we just don't know, where maybe it's just a younger person with no medical history who's, who's died and nobody knows why. That's our jurisdiction. Um, and so in our caseload that we have here, only about 10% of the cases we do are homicides. The rest of the cases are you know, the majority of the cases we do here are either accidents or natural deaths. So uh, when families have loved ones here, I think a lot of times it's very um, upsetting to them. Why is my loved one at the medical examiner's office? What's, what's gonna happen there? And I really would just like to assure families that again, we're gonna treat your loved one with the, most, the utmost dignity and respect. We're gonna get you the answers that, that you need. We're gonna get the, you the closure that you need. 
Um, and just because they're here doesn't mean anybody thinks anything happened, but that's our job to find out. Are a lot of people worried they won't be able to bury their loved one if they come here? Um, I haven't heard they won't be able to bury them. Some people are concerned that if they have an autopsy, they can't have an open casket funeral, um, which is actually untrue. Um, as long, you know, with as long as the, the, um, you know, there's some clothing, as long as there's clothing and the, and the, you know, if you're going to put your loved one in, say, a suit or a dress or something like that, then. Honestly, with the funeral home's work and, and our work, you'll never even know that an autopsy was done. So you can absolutely have an open casket funeral, um, even if you've had an autopsy. Now, sometimes the injuries that some of the decedents have suffered might preclude that, but nothing that we did would preclude that. And if, if a body comes here, does that automatically mean an autopsy is going to happen? Not an autopsy as people think of that. Um, if a body comes here and, and we're taking jurisdiction on the case, um, sometimes bodies come here just for storage because we're not involved. Their primary care is going to sign, their primary care doctor is going to sign, and, and it's not actually our case. They're just coming through our office. If we take jurisdiction and the body comes here, there will be some sort of an examination performed. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we will be, um, you know, examining all parts of the body internally and externally, it, but we will be doing some sort of an examination. Okay, and of course everyone thinks autopsy, and y yes, the images of a body opened up and all of the, but it's not, that's not a given. Correct, not okay. every body who comes through here gets that examination. Okay, anything that I didn't ask that you think is important to note, or especially on the unidentified effort? Um, on the unidentified effort, I would just stress again, I mean, really the goal here is, is, you know, to give these people their name and to give these families their closure. And so anything that the public can do um, in looking at the website or paying attention when, when we do put out these kind of media requests, does anybody know this, this person, really take a look at the photo and think, hey, could that be? And, you know, if it isn't, you know, that's fine. Or, or call Uncle Bob, right, and see, hey, oh, you're there. Okay, we're good, you know? Yeah. Um, but just check in with your family every now and again um, because, you know, it's, it's everybody deserves that in the end.